To all who are new here, my name is Dr. Michelle Henney, and I'd like to welcome you to Releve Sports Medicine's Virtual Journal Club. For additional webinar education opportunities, you can visit our website and register directly for the webinar, or sign up for the email list to be notified of upcoming webinars. We are continuing to update our schedule, so check back often. This video will be available for review after the Journal Club. The information contained in the video content represents the views and opinions of the presenters and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of relevant sports medicine. The mere appearance of video content on the website does not constitute an endorsement by RSM or its affiliates of such video content. The video content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have read or seen on the site. RSM hereby disclaims any and all liability to any party for any direct, indirect, implied, punitive, special, incidental, or other consequential damages arising directly or indirectly from any use of the video content which is provided as is and without warranties. For all athletic trainers who are intending to get live CEUs from the VOC, and for many of you, that is an important time of year because it sounds like next month is when many uh, folks are going to be um, renewing their licenses uh, and their um, board certifications. So you will receive an email one hour after the webinar concludes, which includes a link to the combined quiz evaluation and assessment. You will have up to 72 hours to complete the quiz and the evaluation. This email will come from customer care at gotowebinar.com. Please ensure that this is done to receive your statement of credit. If you don't receive a follow-up email or you have any other concerns, then contact us via our email at journalclub at relevesportsmedicine.com. Once the statement of credit is available for download from our website, you will receive an email notification. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit the question and we will review questions at the conclusion of the presentation. If you cannot see the PowerPoint slides and you're accessing the webinar from your mobile phone, swipe the screen to the left or to the right and the slides will become visible. The recording will be available for review from our website tomorrow. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Michelle Joy, who is a general and forensic psychiatrist. She is the Director of Behavioral Health Emergency Services at the Philadelphia VA Medical Center. She completed her undergraduate degree at Brown University Medical School at Yale School of Medicine and her residency and fellowship at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. She's presenting today on Heads in the Game, Strategies for Tackling Concussions Complexities. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. I'll probably just turn off the camera, so I'm not worried about that, and you can still hear me, right? Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, so I am a psychiatrist, um, like my wonderful introducer uh, said, um, but I have some experience uh, working with traumatic brain injuries. Um, uh, in the context largely of working with a veteran population, though building on the previous disclaimers when working for the federal government, I have to say that none of my uh, opinions are representative of the federal government's, but I'm um, working with the veterans population. You know, you work a lot with persons with traumatic brain injuries, potential traumatic brain injuries, um, but also as a forensic psychiatrist, I work a lot in um, different areas of the law, clearly, and a lot of those lawsuits actually involve head injuries. and um, I got, you know, kind of interested in this uh, with regard to, to sports and athleticism because it's almost the opposite of what we see in the litigation context. And I'll explain that a bit more, but that's a little bit of my background um, with evaluating this both within a clinical and uh, forensic context. So let's see. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about what concussions are, how that uh, term is or is not related to traumatic brain injuries and, and definitions um, thereof. Um, we'll talk a bit about both kind of uh, psychological, psychiatric, and behavioral um, factors that contribute to uh, outcomes regarding head injury um, and also some of those outcomes that develop from a head injury. Um, and then we'll talk about different uh, strategies for assessing uh, these kind of aspects with athletes and then some of those kind of rehabilitation options 
um, you know, in terms of what you might refer to somewhat, someone to and how you might evaluate the need to a referral. And kind of my overarching um, framework for this is really to think about, you know, concussion is such a big part of, of sports medicine and, and, you know, your all's work on, on sidelines and, and within the domain of athletic training. And in some ways it appears super simple because it's the bread and butter of what people do in, in kind of sports injury. Um, but at the same time, it's pretty complicated. So I kind of want to, you know, review these kind of basic factors, break them down and show what's complicated, but also kind of tie it back together and, and show kind of what we, what we do know and what we are able to do within this space. I do have a couple um, videos if they do not work with like what uh, frequently happens uh, during presentations, no problem. But I think this this slide um, does have a video. So I'll just start off with it. I will not play the whole thing, but I was just um, a bit uh, of an introduction. Is it at least moving for you guys, Michelle? Yep, we can okay, see great. it. just slowed down you know this is a long video but just seeing what happens to you know this is particular to football and, and the nfl but just seeing what happens to people's head and neck within some of these injuries you know it happens so quickly um watching it you know but watching it really slowed down and i, I found this video pretty moving um just seeing in the backward stance i'll only play it for another minute but just to kind of see you know how severe some of these injuries really are You, know, I mean, you just see it over and over again and I'll just stop it there but you know it's a, it's a pretty interesting video just seeing it slowed down and kind of backed up like that and um, you know I think that we think about frequently um, oops, head injuries uh, within football obviously American football um, as well as you know soccer um, being the other kind of football uh, for you know um, persons that are that don't live here um, in terms of terminology but there's you know so many sports that we that are really associated with concussion and these are some of them um, actually in some of the literature that I was reading um, you know obviously contact sports are high risk you know when I was sitting down to do this presentation football kept coming up in my mind right and then I'm thinking soccer right those are the two kind of things I think okay, hockey is a kind of intense contact sport. What else is there, you know? But some of the things, obviously boxing and martial arts, I wasn't even thinking of that, even though, you know, that's kind of obvious and something I pay a lot of attention to. But what I was almost um, most surprised about was that uh, equestrian um, sports have uh, some of the highest rates and in incidents of concussion and head injury, which was not something that I thought about at all. Um, and then there are some in things like skiing and biking and tennis, but the rest of them seem, you know, pretty obvious. <clears throat> um, but kind of taking it to basics and, and you know, this will this will be broken down in a way that is almost too simplistic. And I say that for a reason um, that really a concussion is a traumatic brain injury. And what it comes down to so often, um, I did invite one of my, my students or a couple trainees on this, I don't know if they're on here. You know, we've talked about the fact that it depends who you're talking to, um, you know, with regard to what term you use and how that influences how they, how they think about their injury or potential injury. So in sports, we think about concussion all the time. And, you know, a veteran population and a military population, we think about TBI, traumatic brain injury all the time. But these terms are very related. They are not the same and they do not always mean the same thing. Um, but depending on who you're speaking to, right, if you if you said to, you know, a veteran population, well, you got a concussion, they might say, what a concussion? That was, that was a TBI. That was a traumatic brain injury. This is so much worse, right? But if you said perhaps to... Um, to a, a, an athlete, right, you have a traumatic brain injury, they would say, what, this is a concussion, you know, there's, there is overlap and, and some difference between it, but 
but it, it really is meaningful that these terms do overlap and, and how we think about them and what that means and how we speak about them with the people that we're working with. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up to begin with because, you know, again, coming from some of the domain that I work in um, with regard to litigation and lawsuits about head injury, you know, some, some people might use one term more than another. If you're going to use concussion, it doesn't sound severe. But once you say, you know, I, someone has a traumatic brain injury, the potential for compensation and all that is, is so increased. So the terms do have meaning. And there's even, you know, some um, data on the uses of a term within a clinical context. If someone goes to an emergency room, you know, if they hear a term like traumatic brain injury, uh, there might be more likely to, you um, have outcomes associated with it by thinking that, that they have something, you know, that is literally neurologically insulted their brain, it might actually impact the symptoms that they're eventually able to develop. So even starting at the very foundations of this, it gets complicated when we're even talking about something as simple as the terms. Um, but like I said, these kind of terms represent similar clinical states, right, concussion, and really what we're talking about, minor traumatic brain injury when we talk about concussion, but different, you know, they're slightly different in terms of states sometimes, different fields and practitioners use them in different ways. Um, and, and a little bit about how we can think about this is that concussion tends to represent something more immediate, something pretty transient, and, and kind of a form of a minor traumatic brain injury. Um, something that has resulted from the, the brain injury, but still, you know, really thinking about the fact that it is a brain injury and in fact, a traumatic brain injury. Uh, TBI, the term itself, and in particular, minor traumatic brain injury, um, can refer to those kind of the immediate um, effects of a, of a trauma to the head. And people tend to think of it more in terms of, you know, the injury to the brain tissue, brain injury, you know, the literal physical neurological um, changes to the brain tissue, but then in a sense, it also refers in the sense of TBI, the veteran population, certain you know, populations of patients, this kind of long-term um, state of, of injury. So it's almost like they overlap in terms of what happens immediately, they are related, concussion tends to you know, be this very circumscribed aspect that results from a traumatic brain injury, but they really are very similar. And then later we'll talk about the term post-concussive syndrome uh, and persistent post-concussive syndrome, and that even complicates things. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, um, all concussions are forms of minor traumatic brain injury, um, but of course not all minor traumatic brain injuries are concussions. And we'll see if this works. And uh, I am speaking to you from Philadelphia, um, but I am from South Florida. And so I remember, you know, texting Dr. Henny, you know, in, in I think 2022 about, about Tua to Tagovailoa and the multiple concussions that he had. And, and I just wanted to bring this up in terms of when we're talking about identification and management. I don't think it's going to work because it's from the NFL. So I'll skip it if it does not work. Oh, okay. Let's see. Let's see, super quick. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, giving specific, I guess, opinion in a forensic sense about about how the NFL managed this, but just bringing up to a, um, you guys are in Florida. I'm from Florida, and just to think about, you know, how how if you guys saw those kind of injuries in 2022, how they were represented uh, in the media, how um, it was managed, and what we what we can learn from watching those video clips. It's really interesting, actually, because. I tried to put a couple clips in of his injuries and all three times I tried to do that uh, into my PowerPoint presentation, I guess they must be um, you know, owned by the NFL or whatever I wasn't able to. 
But um, but you know, when you kind of go back and look at to his injury, he had he had three concussions, three potential concussions, um, you know, within the span of a year. So when we talk about identifying things, you know, this is on national television, and so you'd think that people are paying, you know, very close uh, attention to the mechanism of injury, how things appear, and then also potential for re-injury. I mean, I just wanted to bring that up because you know this this um uh this person here is you know he's an analyst now but he's a former professional nfl player as well and just thinking about that you know what happened in 2022 and kind of um thinking about that with with regard to head injuries on on the uh national stage oops sorry let's see oops it's gonna take a minute because always okay so you know what he's talking about there is the fact that Right there, it is an injury to the brain. We can talk about the fact that there are all these ways to rehabilitate other parts of the body and even replace them. But we were talking about is literally an injury to what some might say is the most important part of the body, but at least one of the least um, intervenable in a certain way and, and replaceable for sure. So what is the brain injury? And, and these are again, obvious, but when you think about the, the fact that the terms concussion and, and traumatic brain injury are so interrelated, but people don't realize that kind of, people forget that concussion is a brain injury, but what is a brain injury, right? It can be an acceleration or deceleration um, force. Uh, it can be a physical force, which is what we often see in contact sports. Um, you know, in the military, we often see blast injuries. In car accident litigation, we also often see those acceleration, deceleration forces like whiplash. It seems so obvious, but what we are really saying is that something, you know, impacted the head and within that the brain to such an extent that there was a physiologic disruption on contact. And so most of the literature about traumatic brain injury, what that says is that there has to be something that happened immediately from that. Um, it has to have been, you know, something immediately, something neurological, something tied to the brain. So that might be loss of consciousness, that might be amnesia um, for that surrounding time period. Altered mental status is a very broad term. Um, but that can also apply. Seizures obviously are very concerning and focal neurological deficits. So that might be, you know, something, um, you know, a, a part of the body not moving, um, partial blindness, a, a paralyzed uh, limb or, or side of the body, right? Inability to smell, those would all be things that are, are particularly concerning. And these are kind of obvious when you think about traumatic brain injury, but possibly not, you know, if you're not thinking about concussion as a brain injury. Um, in the literature, there are, is, you know, some kind of uh, a lot of controversy about what what defines both of these terms. Um, but a minor minor traumatic brain injury, as comp as compared to a major traumatic brain injury, might be 30 minutes or less of loss of consciousness. So obviously, in sports, a lot of times we're talking about you know seconds, often if not minutes. Um, of injury, but you know, some of the the traumatic brain injuries we see in different settings might be, you know, hour hours of loss of consciousness. So again, we're talking about a particular end of this this spectrum. Um, you know, and this is just summarizing it again. And so people kind of realize we are talking about a brain injury and it is to a force to the head. This is, you know, sometimes I'll be involved in litigation where someone might hit their chin, right? And there's this kind of idea. And of course there can be the whiplash effect, but something really has to impact the, what is in the head enough to cause those kind of immediate changes. <laughs> so as I said, you know, this is kind of, kind of be a mix of structural and functional disturbances. Um, a lot of the definitions require these three kind of components, a traumatic force that causes an injury and an immediate, immediate uh, neurological impact within the medical, neurological, psychiatric, emergency literature. Sometimes that's defined as a Glasgow coma score under 13, which I'll get to definitions um, a bit afterwards. But, you know, kind of the most minor of what we might consider to be um, a concussion would be the feeling of being dazed after an injury to the head, right? So, you know, a seizure is pretty obvious, you know, partial paralysis is pretty obvious, but but where where do we define this kind of feeling dazed after? You know, you might you might um be tackled and feel dazed when it's just you don't even have an impact to the head, right? You're just taken out and it hits your knee and you feel dazed because something happened so sudden. So how do we kind of really define what happens to to someone's head and in terms of the impacts afterward, especially if we're not viewing it in retrospect like the world did with Tua, right? You're, you're viewing it on the sidelines and you're making an immediate decision about kind of um, removal, you know, return to play, those kind of things.
Um, but what's important is there is, you know, there is both this immediate impact and also this kind of downstream um, neurotransmitter and metabolic ca cascade. And, and so often what the medical community really misses um, and what, what ends up happening a lot in courts is that it might not be viewable on an MRI, it might not be viewable on a, a CAT scan, but that doesn't mean that there aren't these other changes associated with that, with what happens in the brain. Um, but most often and, and definitionally, you are going to have those impacts that are um, visible or you know um, felt felt by the athlete. Um, what are some of those changes? Um, as I said, there might be the actual, you know, changes to the, the tissue of the brain that might be, you know, literal impact, you know, kind of Play-Doh to be, you know, um, crude about it. Something is changing the shape of the head, um, but we don't know how much uh, impact to that and how much change in the structure of the brain is really needed to have these other kind of things happen. The changes to the brain chemistry, changes to calcium, um, potassium, and glutamate coming out. Um, and all these other ways that the brain communicates. So even if it is not viewable on head imaging, even if someone were to go to an emergency room, which often is not the case, you know, at a kind of um, sideline evaluation, but even if that were to happen, it might not show on a brain imaging study, uh, despite the fact that there might be these downstream um, changes really to the, to the literal uh, uh, metabolic and chemical effects of the brain, and that's important. But but one of the things to note is that we don't have ways to evaluate these for a clinical population, right? These are things that they know from research, but not something that we're going to make a decision about whether someone's removed or returned to play from. But but it doesn't mean that it's not there and not valid. Um, you know, some of this is going to be a bit basic, but just to kind of review. What are some of the symptoms? You know, these these fall in many categories. And the way the reason I'm kind of reviewing them in a categorical sense is because there's these physical um, symptoms that everyone kind of thinks about: the headache, uh, balance problems, vision problems, um, you know, memory concentration. Um, but the emotional and sleep disturbances, people know that these happen, um, but the literature on kind of paying as much attention to them, paying as much attention to their impact not only on overall life functioning, but also return to play and athletic functioning is pretty limited. And there's also um, literature about the athletic training, um, you know, uh, field uh, in and of itself that these kind of uh, factors are a little bit downplayed, not recognized. And what I found um, in, in one study was actually that the more experience someone has as an athletic trainer, sometimes uh, the, the least evidence-based they are, or the less evidence-based they are with respect to kind of considering these aspects of, of concussion in their decisions regarding, um, you know, evaluation, assessment, and referral of, of a head injury. Um, you know, but some of these things might be, you know, the ones that, uh, you know, bringing in the ears, sensitivity to light and sound, vertigo, um, difficulty concentrating. That's what I hear so much in the litigation aspect. Um, Short-term memory loss, so much of what I hear as well. Um, something that might be more important to sports than other population, that decreased reaction time. Something that might seem less important to sports, but is, is things like emotional, you know, behavioral um, liability, how, how reactive someone is, how kind of aggressive someone is, um, which is not something that they might come forward saying, you know, as much as I'm not able to focus or I'm not able to balance myself, but these other kind of things, how they react um, to things, including, you know, on the field or, or the court is, is just as important. Anxiety is a huge part of this, and um, we'll talk about that a bit um, later too, as is depression. Um, and then, you know, sleep disturbance has a lot of a lot of data in multiple populations, athletes, veterans, um, litigation co uh, context as well as one of the primary kind of um, associations with other symptoms and one of, you know, the things that can change that's also kind of the least paid attention to. Um, should have put this at the beginning, actually, when I was talking about the media, but just to say, for example, uh, or for instance, you know, most people get a lot of their information on this um, from the media, and that includes athletes themselves, right? And so, you know, I was just watching um, Ballers, uh, that HBO show about also South Florida, but um, football in South Florida, you know, so much of it is about head injuries. So whether it's, you know, news specials, um, you know, or watching um, games themselves, or even kind of these, you know, fictionalized representations like ballers, um, you know, that uh, people get a lot of their information from this. And even ourselves as professionals, sometimes we don't realize how much 
and we are influenced by these kind of narratives. Um, so that's why it's important to always kind of return to the data uh, as we're doing today. So um, for the most part, um, most people um, are going to be pretty asymptomatic after after a concussion, and that means after the concussion, right? So to qualify as a concussion, um, you know, kind of to drive this point home, there are going to be symptoms, but most people are asymptomatic after that immediate period. But there is some um, thoughts about this evolution after time. So even if someone kind of has resolution immediately, want to continue to, you know, evaluate and assess those kind of things. Um, and also, um, you know, the vast, vast majority of people will have their symptoms resolve within 10 days. And I mean, that's upward. I mean, it is almost so hard to define uh, terms and, and rates within this population because it varies so much dependent on context. And, and that might be a little bit difficult to see when we're just thinking about an athlete population, but, you know, a head injury is a head injury is a head injury in a certain way, but it's not, right? So, you know, I would say that the data says upwards of 90% of people, you know, return to a symptom-free state within, you know, um, within a week, two weeks amount of time. Most studies say that's longer for children and adolescents, but at the same time, it is almost so hard to define because, you know, it is, you know, starting with the very basics of what defines a head injury, what defines a concussion, what defines a TBI, what are the symptoms that are caused, you know, versus caused by all these things are almost so hard to keep track of that the, the data isn't great about strict timelines. But what we will see in any context is that, you know, the majority of people who have symptoms definitely by um, result of having a concussion or minor traumatic brain injury, they will be pretty asymptomatic afterwards and the vast, vast majority of them uh, will resolve within the one to two week time period. Um, but what we have to think about is the fact that some of those persons will not um, have that resolution. And what we want to consider for those is what predicts um, who will not have that resolution, what might contribute to that uh, lack of resolution and how we can help resolve those continued symptoms. Um, you know, this might be obvious to some of you guys. Uh, it's been updated from the concussion and sports group, and there has been, you know, concussion statements over time. But, you know, it really starts with recognizing and then all the way, you know, down to kind of risk reduction. What, what do we think about kind of all of these aspects of a sports related concussion? And, and you know, that's why I started with recognition because um, sometimes even within the litigation context, I'm saying, what are we really talking about here? Like you, there is a lawsuit for something involving a head injury. Was there even a head injury? And, you know, sometimes if, if you know, a sports uh, event is not televised, you know, we're not always kind of able to rewind this, but getting, getting down to the nitty gritty of what actually happened um, at injury, how did the head injury happen and might how that have impacted the brain, you know, then going on to things like, uh, are we going to remove the athlete at, you know, at field side? I, Half court side, how are we going to continue to evaluate those symptoms of concussion or potential concussion, right? What is in that short duration of period after that, and then the longer duration as well? And how do we um, kind of consider the athlete's return to the sport that if they're able to in the short time, but also, right, uh, repeat concussions? I mean, I'm not even getting into today, um, you know, things about CTE, but obviously all those kind of things to consider. And there are so many psychosocial aspects of this that often get underplayed in, in every context. Um, right, so I won't spend too much time on this, but we, you know, we can't kind of evaluate any kind of injury without making sure that, you know, Eat, that the very basics are followed, even though I'm a psychiatrist and I'm kind of talking about things like depression downstream and what, you know, might cause um, long-term effects of head injury. We have to make sure that we are not ignoring, you know, the most basic um, uh, forms of intervention and assessment at, at the side of the field, but I won't spend too much uh, time on that. Just want to, you know, make sure that you know that I'm not ignoring it. Um, those are some of those red flags um, also associated with that, uh, you know, first aid response. And what's, you know, kind of interesting with, within this context, right, is we are so tuned uh, and in tune with assessing red flags and what be, might be of the neurological and orthopedic outcomes of something that even if we know that a CDI or a concussion might have these kind of neurobiological um, 
effects on, on memory and behavior and emotion and things like that. Sometimes we're so kind of attuned to what happens in the instant that, that it almost dissolves from the fields of evaluation. Um, you know, if something's not really happening, right? Like if we are able to evaluate someone on the sidelines, there are no red flags, you know, there's not what we would consider, you know, an immediate removal from play, you know, it kind of might disappear from our thoughts in terms of reevaluation. Like if we take someone from the field, we know we need to reevaluate them in order to have them return to play. But if what if we don't? What if there was something missed or if it wasn't even missed, but you know, are there kind of sub sub concussive impacts on on these kind of um, softer signs that we need to continue to evaluate? If someone just returns to play, everything doesn't end there is, is what I would say and the purpose of this slide. Um, that's kind of covered already, and, and you guys um, probably already know some of the tools. I'm just going to cover them, and again, with an eye to what are we really considering in terms of the psychological and the mental health um, impacts of this, and also just to make sure, like I said, oftentimes, even with experience and sometimes with more experience within the field, um, we do not always use the most evidence-based uh, tools, and that's also true within, you know, my my domain of psychiatry. So just kind of reminding people that some of these uh, tools are kind of the most um, updated. But but again, going to to this, how much of this is is mental health? You know, we we look at these kind of cognitive impacts and what happens, what's observable. If you, I mean, if you go back to, um, I think it was to his second injury, you kind of see him there, and he has, uh, you know, he has what someone might call the corticate posturing, right? He's tensed up and, and not reacting. And so, um, you know, these things are kind of observable. No Glasgow Chroma score. That is one of the things that if you're evaluating at, you know, at field side, at court side, um, and someone is referred to an emergency room, that's one of the things that a um, doctor in the emergency room is going to understand. That's one of the things that EMT or EMS is going to you know, understand in that short period of time that you're transmitting information. If someone does have to call 911 or, you know, um, uh, transport someone to an emergency room, they will always understand what a Glasgow Cormus score is. And um, that is not only like determinant of uh, concussion and effects afterwards, but a lot of, you know, more important, uh, urgent and emergent things as well. Um, you know, I'm kind of uh, going over these things, but again, you know, these are the things that we think about these kind of balance and gait and neuro neurological impacts. We do think about um, memory on, on the kind of field, and, and that's to say that, you know, people consider, consider memory, um, recall these kind of cognitive um, impacts of, of concussion much more than they think about the hate behavioral one. So obviously, you know, I'm not saying that someone's going to be depressed at the moment of impact or someone's going to have anxiety at the moment of impact on the court, right? But just to point out the fact that we're already thinking about all these other kind of things um, from the beginning. And so the, the uh, kind of ease with which we are able to ignore some of the more subtle um, behavioral health effects is, is kind of obvious when we look at these initial screening tools. Obviously, again, I'm a psychiatrist. You guys know these kind of screening tests that you might use or, or similar ones, but I'm just bringing them up to say, like, what are we actually thinking about from the beginning and what might be lost in that? Um, you know, and again, you know, uh, even for the off-field evaluation, I could have, you know, included another 20 more slides on, on all the parts that those consider, but the symptom evaluation, there are some parts that might be kind of more behavioral and more soft sign, but again, like, what are we missing and what might we be missing, um, while in considering, obviously, these other very important things. Um, let's go at six, so as I think I said, you know, the, the SCAT-6 is kind of what we look at within that immediate period of time um, and with that uh, uh, first, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, period after the injury, but the SCAT-6 can go out to multiple weeks, even about to a month and a half after um, injury or suspected injury. And so these are some of the things that you might not be doing right at, at court side, at field side, but some of the things that are going to be evaluated. And again, right, that this is when, you know, we are looking more at things like anxiety, depression, and sleep. Um, and, and what is kind of interesting is, you know, at least in my experience with pro populations broadly, um, my review of the literature, um, 
you know, that we don't have a lot of like history at baseline about these things, right? People get like cleared to play. Um, they might have like a basic, you know, making sure they don't have marfins or something like that. But um, a lot of times we don't have this background information and, uh, you know, about someone's anxiety or depression. And so if there were time um, and kind of ability, uh, whatever payment structures are to get some of these baseline uh, measures, it would definitely improve outcomes in terms of who we are able to evaluate uh, as having impacts of concussion downstream because uh, so, 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 so much of the literature and what I spend most of my time in the litigation context is, is that someone does not remember, you know, necessarily what their anxiety was like before a head injury, what their depression is like before a head injury within the population. I see most often people are saying that they had less before injury and more after, but it's the opposite with the athlete population, right? Someone might be much more downplaying the impact um, or the effects that they have afterwards. So it is really good if, if someone has the ability to kind of look at these or assess these um, very same measures from the SCO at six um, in a pre-morbid context so that there can be a comparative um, basis, which is not often done and, and we get why, right? Um, but it, it would be great, especially with those more subjective things like anxiety, depression, and sleep, because people's uh, ability to um, remember those and, and self-reflect and report them are, are significantly impaired in any context, though in different directions. Um, a lot of, you know, kind of even within a couple of years ago, um, you know, the literature about what happens after a concussion was going to be this, you know, kind of brief period of rest. Um, but what we know now and what's been updated most recently is that that is relative rest, right? We're not telling someone to, uh, ret you know, have strict bed rest. Um, and even in that initial period, it is a relative rest. That means continuing activities of daily living that might even include low intensity sport. Um, and just really from the beginning, a strategy for returning and what those goals might be. You know, this is not head injury at all. I, I texted Dr. Henny, uh, I guess uh, about six weeks ago, um, but I broke my fibula, right? And so I um, got back from ortho and PT just this week, uh, you know, six weeks post-injury. And I've broken about 10 bones in my life, mainly um, playing sports. And I'm just it, like flabbergasted by the fact that, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, um, when I was breaking bones, uh, I would have been in a cast still now. And I'm six weeks post-injury, right? And barely even... Uh, you know, in a in a gaunt brace or whatever. And so just to say that these kind of protocols change over time, like my, my ortho said, like, you kind of forget you still have a literal broken leg because you're walking around. And I was like, that's right. You know, when I was breaking uh, bones before, I would have still been in a cast. So, you know, this is obviously, we're not talking about ankle injuries today, but just to say that these protocols change over time. So, you know, in the same way that Years ago, I would have been in a cast still, and now I'm kind of barely even in a minor brace, let alone, you know, a, a boot. And the same way that we think with regard to head injury, people are not, you know, bed rest, bed rest. You know, we are, it's a relative rest recommendation, definitely decreased screen time and some of these more intensive cognitive procedures, but it is not, um, you know, disconnect. And, and that is in a lot of ways related to kind of psychosocial things, um, as we will see. Um, so some of the things that, you know, in those early periods, what we might want to refer people to, uh, I'm going to kind of go briefly over this because they're less neuropsych related, but um, more neurological, I suppose, but, you know, 10 days of some of these um, subjective, still subjective symptoms, but dizziness and headaches, these kind of rehabilitation things. Um, with regard to neck and balance. Um, but overall, you know, over 30 days within the athlete population, you're gonna really think about uh, a multimodal um, aspect of uh, referral collaboration and treatment. And that is gonna include kind of the mental health aspect at that time. And just to say, I mean, we could have a whole talk about uh, the insurance structure, payment structure, availability of mental health care in the United States. But when we're looking at symptoms over 30 days, right, how long does it take people to even get an appointment and then get into care? So this is really something we have to think about early. Um, you know, if it's at 30 days and all of a sudden, you know, it's going to take three, four months to get an appointment, that's that's not the recommendation, right? So we think we need to think of it earlier. Um, because of the complexity of, of getting kind of access to care in many, in many um, you know, parts of this country and with many populations. 
um, with regard to how we think about recovery, you know, we keep talking about return to sport, but what are the ways in which, you know, recovery is defined? And that's why also the literature is kind of complicated. Is it that someone's symptom free? Is it baseline symptoms? Because, you know, interestingly, again, for the forensic context, a lot of people that report um, persistent post-concussive sy symptoms uh, have very similar symptoms. Um, to people that have not had head injury, right? So something like a bit of nausea or headache, right? So, so is it returned to what they had beforehand? Again, remembering that uh, people are very bad at reporting what they had before head injury. Is it returned to full activity? Is it returned to full function? Um, or is it comparison to, you know, another group or population? And this is more important, right, for evaluating the literature. So when you go and look at what are the, you know, most current studies kind of thinking about, well, with, with what respect are we defining recovery? And, and what does that mean for thinking about the people that I work with? Um, you know, and there are all these other ways, right? And so sometimes in a lawsuit, someone will bring in something like this and saying, look, uh, we, we did this, you know, very complex study and we proved that this person had this, you know, head injury because this diffuse tensor imaging showed this thing. It's great for research, but we definitely have not, um, you know, gotten use of this in a clinical population and that includes sports, right? And so that doesn't mean like, if someone had access to it, it would make sense and they just don't have access to it because we don't use it. No, it's not defined yet. And we don't have enough like ways to think about this and use this. But some of these things, you know, might also be coming downstream, but they are not there yet. And that includes for neuroimaging, right? Just because someone does not have, you know, impact on neuroimaging, it might still still be there and still be relevant. Um, I just want to make sure we have a little bit of time for questions at the end, too. So. It's just kind of saying things are complex, right? There, are, it's it's complex, so poorly understood. We don't have objective markers. There's all these kind of interrelationships. We don't know, you know, who's getting better, why, and how come. And that compares, you know, to other injuries, orthopedic injuries within this population, and you know, head injury persons outside of of sports as well. Um, so when we're thinking about, you know, someone's getting better, and then who doesn't, uh, persistent um, post-concussive syndrome is what you're going to see in the literature and, and what a lot of this um, terminology is about. And this is when we get to these kind of neuropsych symptoms, right? So I, I said right on the field, we have very little kind of attention to the depression and the anxiety because that doesn't happen immediately. But what we see is the people that tend to have symptoms long term are going to have a lot of these neuropsych symptoms and sometimes the physical too. But this is when it's going to become um, much more predominant and why we need to think about who might have it beforehand as well. Because you know, if a person says that I developed these, I got hit in the head, I, you know, I was tackled, uh, the horse kicked me, I developed these things afterwards, they're not great reporters of it. Um, whether or not that they think in retrospect it was due to that, there are very many things that we need to consider that might have contributed to their development of those things afterwards, um, you know, and not just the injury itself. Um, and within my field, it's, it's pretty interesting, I'll get to, um, kind of the definitions in a minute, but it's so controversial that within the last three editions of our, you know, quote unquote Bible, the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual um, that we use for diagnoses, it has, you know, been changed, taken out, removed, and contextualized multiple times. So, um, you know, we can say that some people don't get better, but who doesn't get better and why and whether or not it is caused by the actual injury is really important to think about. Um, what are some of the factors that might contribute to a prolonged recovery um, or be markers of that? That's the amnesia around it. It is, you know, the severity of the burden, um, dizziness, and cognitive symptoms in the very immediate context. Um, but perhaps, um, you know, more than that or, or just as much are things like, um, you know, previous concussions, history of migraines. That is a huge thing that's often not screened for, but if someone has um, migraines before, they're much more likely to have a longer um, time course of symptoms, including migraines, but not just that. Older age, also tied to previous concussions, learning disabilities, things like that. Um, but, you know, within what you guys are recommending and what we can think about too is, you know, what, you know, factors of return to play might be um, associated with prolonged recovery. 
um, how long it takes someone to see a healthcare provider. And I include social isolation on there, even though it's a psychosocial context that I'll talk about later, but also, you know, I'm not just saying like, everyone needs to be taken out of play and everyone needs to be referred to a doctor because I'll, you know, improve outcomes for everyone. No, because we know that sports and um, community and play and financial uh, remuneration, all these things are also important. So, you know, social isolation is a part of that. If we just said, well, just take everyone that has a potential injury out for three months, yeah, you might improve some of this stuff, but also you have like negative effects of taking someone out of, out of play um, as well. Um, so within my domain, what are some of these like really important things that contribute fear? Um, emotional factors, anxiety, um, as related to an independent for, from fear, um, and all these kind of psychosocial um, factors are going to contribute to the chronicity of symptoms after injury, the severity of it, um, symptoms after injury, and the impact of those symptoms on someone's functioning, including ability to play sport, but even work and things independent of that. You know, athlete identity is an important part of this. Um, these things are often deprioritized and, you know, much less important for y'all, but one of the biggest factors related to um, injury, and this does not, um, injuries impact, and this does not mean someone is lying or faking all the time is, is litigation, you know, a case takes years, and so, you know, what even subconscious influences are, are there on that um, to contribute to someone's symptom report, and I'm not saying this guy, to you guys because you are involved in litigation all the time, but just to say, like, how complex these things are. And, and you know, if something within my field, the, the thing that is most clearly tied to symptoms, even more than severity of head injury is litigation, right? What else could we be missing? What else do we have to consider for, for head injuries? Um, you know, and what do we think about in terms of mental recovery? Like, it's very easy, you know, I saw PT yesterday and she said, what are your goals, you know, with return to, um, functioning after after physical therapy, I said, well, you know, I have a pretty sedentary lifestyle. I'd like to be able to, you know, walk up and down the stairs again pretty easily. I'd like to, you know, at least run if I had to for a short distance. I'm not a I'm not an athlete, so I'm not kind of timing myself in terms of you know my my mile. But you know, those kind of things are quantitative and easily easy to define, um, you know, in a sense. But how are we thinking about mental recovery and and defining that? Um, and how often and early are we thinking about that, right? This was my first intake with, this is my intake appointment with my physical therapist. And she says like, what are your goals? How often are we thinking about that for a concussion population with regard to the mental aspects of things? And how do we define that? You know, one's, one's ability, one's confidence in oneself, um, one's ability, not just to play sports, but the meaning of, of engaging in that to them, but also other things like you know, engaging in family and social and occupational affairs as well. Um, one of these things um, that we're, that, you know, that really contributes is fear. Uh, and that's very complex, right? Anything that we're going to, you know, attribute to kind of the mental health domain is going to be complex and fear is one of those. Um, and that can both, you know, accelerate or hinder return to sport because the fear might be kinesophobia, right? Like, um, uh when i was supposed to get my um you know my stress uh bearing weight right for my x-ray like i couldn't do it like i literally kept trying and i kept trying to put my foot up on that stool to get my x-ray i couldn't do it it didn't even hurt yet i was just too afraid of it hurting <laughs> to do it right and so you know even in the long term people have that kind of fear so so is someone's fear and anxiety about re-injury is it is it fear of hurting themselves because of the injury or is it fear of kind of what that might do to them? These are all the kinds of fears that we have to think about. And right, like um, kinesiophobia might be, okay, I know it hurt. Like if I go back in and, and move my neck in this way, it's gonna hurt again because it's not yet fully healed. But you know, this kind of fear of recurrent concussion is another aspect of it. And then beyond that, we have the anxiety aspect, right? And so whether, you know, when someone returns to play, if they have been out, they might be anxious for a lot of reasons. And some of that, you know, are we thinking about it in terms of the, the injury caused an impact to the head, which caused these neurobiological changes, which caused the anxiety, or is it because this person was out of play, you know, 
it is not directly due to the injury itself, but this person was out of play. They're scared about going back or they're scared about not going back and all of these kind of things. We can't really determine what is from that literal impact. But they are all related and important, right? So if someone is so worried about how they might perform or someone is worried about, you know, not being able to go back versus going back, all these kind of things are related, but it is not, it is not easily determined what is, you know, a result of that impact to the head versus associated with the broad kind of context of that injury, including taking someone out of play and returning them back. And that's why, you know, if I'm saying it's complicated as a psychiatrist and as someone that's involved in kind of very complex levels of analysis of this, including, you know, very expensive lawsuits, um, you know, I do not expect everyone to be able to, you know, know this at, at field at court side, but just to think these are the things that we, you know, we don't know what we don't know sometimes, but these are the things that might think about a referral to a mental health provider. Like this person seems a little nervous. I don't know if it's, you know, that, that their neck is going to hurt them again when they get back in there, or is it related to something deeper? Are they scared to go back? These are the things that, you know, you guys are great and you know, the persons that you work with most likely very closely. Um, you know, of course, sometimes you don't, if, depending on what the context is, but these are the things to be thinking about and what may raise your kind of spidey senses for a referral. You only have like um, uh, a couple slides because um, I want to leave time for questions. So just getting to this, right? So there's this pressure to keep playing that might be internal, that might be external. Um, again, within the domain that you guys work in, symptoms are most often underreported are um, associated people want to get back to play whether or not that's um, associated with with finances or not in a lot of you know at, uh, elite athlete populations it is going to be insignificant but you know on my end of things it's going to be reported in the opposite direction right that people are going to over report and that does not people mean that people are lying in every sense like it is sometimes hard to imagine you know that something can vary so much depending on context without like literal lying, but but there are so many subconscious factors. Someone might truly believe and be able to, to convince themselves without lying that they are not feeling something just because of how badly they wanna play, right? And in my domain, right, someone might truly believe that they are impacted and impaired because of X, Y, Z, including financial compensation, but that does not mean that they sit there and say, how can I, you know, concoct this story? um let's see i'll skip oops um i'll skip that for a minute um you know depression is another thing you know along the lines of of anxiety and fear um you know both uh severity of head impact number of head impact i mean these these kind of things are associated so so deeply and so so intimately with depression um and that includes you know with the number of head impacts concussions minor traumatic brain injuries we're talking about 100 200 300 percent times risk and like i said sometimes we do not know that someone had depression beforehand and oftentimes pre-morbid or pre-injury mental health symptoms are more associated with head injury outcomes um, than the other way around, but they are deeply uh, tied in. That's another thing that we need to be thinking about. And again, so complex that this is when a referral makes sense. Um, so, right, what is this complexity? Why are we talking about it? What is, I mean, even there is a moment of impact, even if we're talking about a single injury, but it is still complex to know what what is a cause of the injury or not, whether or not someone says that something happened afterwards or not, we do not know that really because Pearson's retrospective report are really impaired on no matter what, you know, and non-intentionally. So whether you were there and witnessed the injury or not, sometimes that collateral information might be important in any context, you know, if you're working with a family in a school context, you know, kind of really finding out what, what was someone's state um, beforehand, even if it's not about that removal from play, right? This kind of idea of management going forward. You know, like I said, this this kind of diagnostic thing is so complex that within certain domains, um, you know, like a litigation complex, they are saying is post-concussive syndrome even a clinical reality, but we need to kind of consider it. I think even more so within the athlete context because things are downplayed within within you know the athlete population, whereas with the people I work with, they tend to be overplayed. Um, and those are some of the reasons that people might say that it is not a clinical reality because if someone says I have headaches, nausea, and I you know um, am uh, you know uneasy on my feet on the way to the bathroom in the middle of the night, 
was that really present before or after? It's really hard to know. Um, this is just to say for one quick minute, I mean, even within the last, you know, 20, 25 years, um, DSM is our, you know, diagnostic statistical manual. We've taken post-concussive um, syndrome in, we've taken it out. You know, there was a PCS diagnosis, now there's none. You know, as of 2013, they, you know, called it basically a mild dementia due to TBI, but then they even can um, contextualize that to say, hey, I mean, it literally says like, hey, this isn't always what it seems. Um, a lot of times impairments are more severe than injury. So when that happens, we need to think about, you know, multiple other reasons um, that someone might be reporting these symptoms. So, you know, this is our literal kind of Bible within our fields. And there, it's kind of the only, you know, diagnosis that I can think of that has a stop sign and said, hey, you might be making this right, but let's reconsider this diagnosis. Um, I talked about some of this a bit before, um, you know, and this is this is a slide about retirement, but, you know, it doesn't have to be retirement necessarily for an elite athlete. It can be, you know, about someone coming out of, um, you know, a, a high school athlete, um, you know, role or deciding whether to go on and play college sport. I, I stopped playing um, uh, sports in high school, you know, but that was a big decision to me at the time. And, you know, it depends on the population you're working with, but all these things are pretty complex and head injury, you know, in the way that those are complex themselves, you know, contribute to the complexity of these decisions. Um, but if someone is working with an elite athlete population, just to think about how meaningful these kind of decisions are and how that might, you know, influence someone's um, decisions around around reporting head injury and, and impact. And then just to think if it's not just with regard to like, if someone's making a decision about retirement, you know, with regard to multiple head injuries, okay, they don't have a depressive symptomatology because of that, okay, but let's still think about what might happen to them with a retirement decision and, and you know, whether mental health treatment doesn't always mean medication so that someone has, quote, a mental illness, but how can we support someone's, like, well-being in, in making these decisions and afterwards? And I think I have a couple more minutes left, so I will pause there and see if anyone has questions. <laughs> Okay, the, the first question um, comes from Amber, and she asks, what are the considerations and caveats from a psychiatrist's perspective to using the G87 and the PHQ-4 in the post-concussion um, SCOAT-6 or SCOAT-6 evaluation? Is this an oversimplification? Yeah. Go ahead. Yep. So I think, you know, again, I think that um, what, you know, those are those are screening tools, right? And so um, what sometimes people forget is something with, right, a PHQ or a GAD um, uh, screening is that it is not necessarily diagnosis, right? So even if we weren't considering it within a, a head injury context, right, th this might, when you screen someone and they have a positive score, this indicates the possibility or the likelihood that someone might have, you know, a diagnosis, but like everything else, we don't make these kind of diagnoses and same with the scan and SCOAT, like we do not make the diagnoses, um, you know, dependent on the screening tool. And that's the same with the GAD and PHQ. So I think that that's one caveat to think about because, you know, even within a litigation context, I hear a lot like this was consistent with the anxiety or this was consistent with depression. No. Um, but the other thing to think about, again, is that retrospective inquiry. Like if someone has, you know, even a floridly positive, let's say like the highest score in the GAD7, like might they have had that beforehand and we don't know. So those are the two caveats to say it is not consistent with the diagnostic label um, or clinical entity. And also we do not know the cause of it, you know, even if it's indicating a high likelihood or, or potential for a disorder, it might have been there beforehand or symptoms consistent with it and we didn't know. Okay, the um, next question comes from Brian and he asks, uh, what supplements can be used to assist an athlete in their recovery from a concussion? Sorry, can you repeat it again, Michelle? Oh, yes. What uh, Brian asks, what supplements can be used to assist an athlete in their recovery from a concussion? Oh, supplements, meaning like um, vitamins and things like that, um, like uh, 
alternative complementary medication? I actually don't know, and that's a really good question. I mean, so often, you know, I think within the medical field, um, physicians are really adverse to thinking about this domain of things, and I'm not. Like, I grew up uh, with a family we mainly use complementary and alternative medication, so I would love to say I have the answer to that. I actually didn't look at it or think about it, but you know, what I would imagine and want to think about would be things like Ginkgo and CoQ10, and you know, that's what I'm going to look at after this. Um, and again, just to say physicians are also often like, I don't want to be sued, so I'm not going to give a recommendation about that or talk about it with my patients. But, um, you know, so often that's what our patients are looking to and, and, you know, not just with regard to what might help, but also telling, you know, people what they might be scammed by, I think is really important. So I don't have the answer to that, but that is something I'm going to look up right after that. Thanks for asking. The next question comes from Kristen and she asks, can you recommend good resources for a more in-depth look at the metabolic cascade in concussion? I can. Um, would it make sense for me to email that to you, Michelle? Could you send it out after, or is that not possible? <laughs> I, we can definitely do that. Okay, awesome. I will do that because there is um, one really good paper. I don't have it in front of me, but, but I want to make sure to get the right citation for it. Okay, the next is um, more of a comment uh, coming from Jessica. She said, excellent presentation with valuable and practical information. Thank you. And then she also noted those that are still needing CEUs to report for the VOC deadline, uh, EBP Central is offering free CEUs this week. December 13th is risk management and December 14th is on sleep recovery and optimal performance good luck with filling your guys ceus i know we have that as well <laughs> and that looks like that's those are the questions that we had um, put forward. So thank Perfect. you. I will send you that one citation as soon as I get off this. I'll send it to you guys, and uh, that way you can send it out. Sounds good. Thank you, and thank awesome. you. Good to see you.